And uh, I did have the pleasure of sitting through the last half hour of John Cronin's talk. And so I can't resist. I wish he were here, and I wish we could do a real engagement. We will someday. But here are some of the things I would ask or, or maybe say. So one is, why does securities law focus so much on preventing someone from doing something at all to prevent others from doing things that are wrong? In other words, do we require a restaurant to spend $100,000 on lawyer's bills before they open their door? If that was true, we'd have no restaurants. Second question I would ask is, if we're so concerned about protecting low-income residents from losing their life savings, how come we don't prevent them from going into casinos? <laughs> There's 1,000 casinos in North America. Do we put an income requirement on that? So we say to people, you can risk everything for nothing in a casino, but when it comes to putting money in local small business, sorry, you can't do it unless you pay off lawyers huge amounts of money. I agree with the question, I forget who asked the question about the multiplying um, rates of return. That was a very, very important question, um, because isn't the whole system we have right now fraudulent? I mean, what we have is a system where all of us are investing systematically in Fortune 500 companies that are destroying our communities. And that, you know, if I was home today, listening to AM radio. I'd be listening to, you know, the, the, the uh, unbelievably boring Rick Edelman talking about how if I left money in the stock market for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I would get 8%, no 10%, no 12% on my money. When in fact, the average rate of return of Wall Street over 140 years has been 2.6%. And only through these annual multiplying acts do we come up with higher numbers. And that's why that question was so insightful. And here's my, my last question would be is, yeah, I agree that this crowdfunding law will result in a lot of fraud. But does that really mean that we're going to stop crowdfunding? No, because where is the fraud going to be? It's going to be over long distances. Those of us who actually know the companies that we are putting our money into, meet the entrepreneur, talk with the workforce, touch the goods, experience the services, this is the best way of preventing fraud. And so if the net result is we get very skeptical about passive investment at all levels, this will be a home run success. I would be happy to continue this line of dialogue in question and answer. Um, but uh, Lynn invited me to um, talk about something a little bit different. When we had an opportunity of spending time together uh, about a month ago at a New England gathering of businesses, and, and there's a couple of people here who were at that gathering, uh, there were two talks that I gave that day. One talk was focused on why and how local investment, and the other talk was what would be a vision of local economy success in the year 2020. And, and, and Lynn, being a both-and kind of person, said, do both talks in half the time. <laughs> so I have um, I've tried to put these things together. Uh, and hence the title, New England 2020, you know, 2020 vision, 2020 success. What are 12 things that will happen? And that this group could actually be an instrumental, uh, instrumental part in making happen that would lead to tremendous success in the region. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about why local economies and local investment matters. I think everyone here understands it at an intuitive level, 
but it's useful to kind of run through the data briefly so we understand why we are so committed to making local investment work. So, some of you know this study that was done in Austin, Texas, about 10 years ago by a group called Civic Economics, looking at the impact of $100 spent at a local bookstore versus $100 spent at a non-local Borders bookstore. Borders, of course, is now a bankrupt bookstore. <laughs> $100 spent at the local bookstore left $45 in the local economy. $100 spent at the local bookstore, uh, at, at, at the uh, borders, left $13. So, you know, roughly speaking, if you buy the same bookstore at the same price at the borders, you get one-third the jobs in your economy, one-third the income and the, and the, the income and the wealth affects one third the tax collections, one third the charitable contributions. Why was there this difference? Borders did not have a high level management team on the ground. Local bookstore did. Borders did not use local business services. The local bookstore did. The borders did not advertise on local radio and TV. The local bookstore did. The borders did not have a stream of profits coming into the community. The local bookstore did. If you generalize from that, you would realize it would really be an unusual comparison between two businesses, one local, one non-local, where you would get more economic impact from the non-local business. And in point of fact, we have about two dozen studies that have been done now, half in the United States, half abroad, and they basically show that for every dollar you spend at a local business, you get two to four times the economic development impact, like jobs, than you would get if you spent that money at a non-local business. And there is not a single study that has shown otherwise. This is a very robust finding. It helps to explain why even the Harvard Business <laughs> Review can have articles like more small firms means more jobs. It's a regression analysis done by Ed Gleaser at, at, uh, in the Harvard Economics Department that basically shows that regions with a high density of small and home-based businesses have the highest growth rates. Another study from Penn State came out a little bit after this one, showed that income growth per capita also is correlated with the presence of local businesses in a jurisdiction. And there is a pile of literature out there showing that if you're interested in smart growth, <coughs> walkable communities, local businesses are key. Because if you think about it, you cannot create a walkable community with a big box hellhole. It just doesn't spatially work. And the same thing with industrial development parks. If you're interested in tourism, we're interested in the most unique businesses, most unique restaurants and hotels and shops that draw in tourists. If you're interested in entrepreneurship, it is generated in spades by the startup of local businesses. There's a sociology literature that shows that the presence of local businesses is associated with civic order and with greater public health. And there's a political science literature that shows that the presence of local businesses is associated with greater voting participation and greater engagement in the nonprofit sector. So it's a pretty long list of benefits that come from locally owned businesses. Really, the only challenge that I think is effectively mounted against this argument is to say, well, all things being equal, if I have two apples here, a local apple versus a non-local apple, same price, same quality, same convenience, of course my, my local apple will generate all these economic impacts. But, but in point of fact, our, these apples are never the same. The local apple is always going to be more expensive. Um, there's a book that just came out last week called The Locavore's Dilemma, 
um, published by two right-wingers in Toronto. Um, and and what's, what's remarkable about the book is that the chapter on economics says, you know, basically, of course, local food is always more expensive than non-local food. Therefore, here are all the consequences that happen from local food. It's, you know, it's, it's like a standard economics. You make a nutty assumption and then you build a whole discourse around it. <laughs> anyway, the, the, point, the point is that um, that local apple actually sometimes is competitive, sometimes is cheaper. And here is the big evidence of it. If it were true, Forget about apples. Let's just talk about businesses. If it were true that local businesses were less competitive than non-local businesses over the last 20 years of globalization, we would have seen a massive consolidation of the workforce in big Fortune 500 companies and the destruction en masse of local small business. Now, this has happened in some sectors, like some retail sectors. But in point of fact, this red stuff here is the, you know, is the part of the economy that is large business. This is medium scale business, technically small, and this is what all of us would agree is small business. If you took a microscope here, you would find a 2% growth of the presence of jobs, the percentage of jobs that are in the large business part of the economy. But remember, that's jobs. It doesn't count home-based businesses. And when you take into account home-based businesses, there's been no change whatsoever. Despite massive bias in public policy, like a double diamond ski slope against local small business, I'll give you an example. We have we have economic incentive programs supported by Democrats and Republicans alike, like your governor, that are entirely focused on the attraction of non-local business. The net effect is to make local business less competitive. <coughs> Imagine if we had public policy that wasn't in the business of destroying local business. <laughs> what this might have looked like in the last 20 years. <laughs> You could pull a page from Statistical Abstract and find that sole proprietorships, where most small businesses either are or start out as, are three times as profitable as C corporations, which most large businesses are, with partnerships falling in between. And if you think local businesses are profitable now, in a way you haven't seen anything yet. Think of it this way, two-thirds of what you spend your money on is service. Service is inherently competitive at the local level. Goods, it's been tougher. But in fact, it turns out that about three quarters of what we spend our money on in goods is on what are called non-durable goods, things we consume a lot of, paper, food, building materials. The interesting characteristic of all of these things is that they weigh a lot relative to their value. That means they are the most susceptible to rising oil prices. You're not going to import bricks from China with $300 a barrel oil like we do now. And so we're going to see, as energy prices rise, a massive relocalization of the manufacturing of our non-durable goods. Electronics may still be a globalized phenomenon. So let me turn now to how, based on all of that, how using the principles we've just talked about, about localization, how this region became a model for the United States and for the rest of the world. Because because we know that local business and import substitution is the best way of creating jobs, this region in 2020 could model itself as having the lowest unemployment, the highest income growth, and the lowest inequality. And I would say right now probably 
depending on how you count it, maybe 55, 60% of your jobs are in local business. There's no reason that could, couldn't be 80 or 90% of the jobs in local business in 2020. And maybe 80% self-reliance would be a reasonable goal. Remember, again, two-thirds of what you're spending your money on is service. That's easy to be self-reliant on. So we're just talking about a somewhat modest increase in the goods part of the equation. How are, how are you going to get from here to there? Well, number one, we're going to create great reports at the local level, at the county level, at the state level and at the regional level. State of the city reports. And these reports are going to have indicators. One of the indicators that you're going to look at is what percentage of the business community is locally owned. And as you see the growth of that, you will know you're doing the right thing. As you see the contraction, you will know you're doing the wrong thing. Another indicator will be leakage. Looking sector by sector, what I mean by leakage is, to what extent are you buying goods and services from outside the community that you could competitively produce for yourself? Because every outside purchase is a lost opportunity to grow a business in your community and enjoy the economic multiplier benefits that come from that. We might report on the great successes that have occurred over the previous year with local business development. We might do an assessment of public policy and all of the biases that we're seeing in public policy against local small business. The second thing that we would see over the, over the previous eight years, between 2012 and 2020, is a dramatic expansion of business alliances. Local business alliances are kind of like chambers of commerce, only they do a lot more than just kibitz with each other. <laughs> Plus, they genuinely represent the interests of local small business, which happen not to fall in line with the Chamber of Commerce on a number of critical issues. For example, one of the things that local business alliances can promote is the creation of sector-specific groups in food. Local food people working together, local finance people working together, local energy people working together, which is, of course, what brings us all together today. And I think if we can start to you know, build these kinds of webs of collaboration, we can help to render local small businesses more competitive. We mentor one another. We provide technical assistance to one another. Tucson Originals is a group of local food businesses in Tucson, Arizona. It's been around for more than a decade. They collectively buy foodstuffs and kitchen equipment and thereby bring down their costs of production and become more competitive. They also do joint marketing together. We can find ways in which Small manufacturers can team up and form flexible manufacturing networks, much like small businesses did in the Italian region of Emilia-Romagna after World War II. And they actually then became one of the wealthiest regions in Europe. Number four, we're going to start creating a seamless network of entrepreneurship support. We're going to help people, starting in grade school, think about what model business plans look like. We're going to create courses for people in and out of school. We're going to make sure those courses are open to people coming out of jail, coming off welfare, who are in retirement and we might have otherwise forgotten about. We're going to create mentorship programs so retirees are dealing, are, are supporting young entrepreneurs sector by sector. We're going to create self-financing incubators so that, you know, if you're doing food businesses, you have kitchen incubators that you're working with. If you're doing small finance businesses, you have kind of a, an associated group of banks and investors who are supporting you in your investment incubator. 
Number five, how do we start to finance all this stuff? Easy, easy. We've got plenty of money in economic development. We're just throwing it down the rat hole on all the wrong stuff right now. And the next time your, your enlightened governor thinks we should be spending one or two hundred thousand dollars per job to attract a big outside company, say, let's take a 60 day break and see what local businesses could bring to the table for, say, $99,000 a job? <laughs> I suspect several of you might have some business proposals. The only way economic development as we know it thrives is because it's, an, it's not a competitive playing field. And we've got to demand that this playing field be opened up to us, to small food producers and small energy producers and small finance service deliverers. Number six. There's talk throughout New England about a 10% shift to get people to shift 10% of their purchasing. Forget about 10%. We need a 90% shift. I've already laid out for you what the competitiveness of local is looking like and why it's going to become more competitive. I could spend actually two hours giving you a lot more reasons than that. But I think, I mean, here's something that's interesting. In every place where there, are, where, where there has been a local first campaign, people buy more local goods more of the time. Now think about how profound that is. Because if it were true that local businesses and local goods were not competitive, the more information we gave consumers about this stuff, the less they would be buying it, right? So what we know is that consumers lack good information about local goods and services. And we're starting to see great ways of meeting those needs through self-financing kinds of businesses. So for example, Supportland is a great gift card. Well, it's actually, it's actually more of a loyalty card. They ultimately want it to become a gift card. But it's a loyalty card in Portland. Every time you spend this at a participating local business, uh, you rack up points for discounts on other goods at those businesses. Uh, right now, I think there's about 150 businesses participating, and they pay something like five, fifty dollars a month for the privilege of participating because it's been such a good driver of demand of people through their doors. Purple <coughs> Bucks is a local debit card done with a uh, local credit union, uh, Mission San Francisco. And every time you spend this card, the credit union gets a certain service fee. But by agreement, the credit union has said, we're going to give our fee to Bernal Bucks. So basically, Bernal Bucks has found a way to finance itself through the fee linked with the local debit card. Number seven, local procurement. We're going to see a revolution of local procurement. And, you know, um, over, over the last 10 years, we've seen economic developers fall. We've seen securities regulators fall. Now we're going to see procurement officers and their vision of the world fall. And here's, here's why. There are maybe 30 municipalities and states right now that selectively buy local stuff. They buy across the board with a 5% or maybe a 10% preference for local goods or services. My view is, is that ultimately this stuff is going to be held unconstitutional um, as a violation of the Commerce Clause and also our treaty obligations under the World Trade Organization. But there is a solution. And the solution also happens to be one consistent with economic efficiency. Because the bid that we get from a company as a state is only the nominal bid. It doesn't take into account the long-term costs and benefits of what's being offered to us. And part of that long-term package is the taxes that we collect. So we should, in addition to taking a bid, we should ask what percentage of this contract 
will be spent with other businesses in our jurisdiction. We run a quick multiplier analysis. We see what the tax collections would be. And so that the real, the real price of a bid is the nominal price minus the taxes that you collect. So this is the way we make our procurement system um, more efficient. Now, the, true, the reason why this is legal and the other things aren't is that I could be a Taiwanese company, come into Northampton, participate under this program and say, I'm spending everything in Northampton and do very well under this system. So it's not discriminatory. It just happens to be really unlikely that the Taiwanese company would be structured this way. Number eight, green taxes. Um, all of us have our own pet dreams about what we want to do with taxes, how we want to tweak income taxes and property taxes and sales taxes. I just find the whole discourse really insane. Um, because look, Everything we're doing right now is taxing things we want more of, which is income and property use and wealth and, um, and, and, and sales activity. Let's start taxing the things we want less of, like pollution, like cigarette smoking, which we are effectively taxing already, like non-renewable energy use. So suppose we were to just put taxes on energy. So this is my little Gadonk experiment, thought experiment. US energy consumption is about 100 quadrillion BTUs. The total tax collection at all levels of government is $3 trillion in the United States. That works out to about $2.50 per gallon of gas on all energy uses. Our variation in the price of gas in the last three years has been greater than two and a half dollars. If we had just got, turned the clock back five years, you know, and slapped on a two and a half dollar tax on gasoline and put the equivalent on other energy uses, we could get rid of all taxes. This is why a lot of conservatives actually are very excited about green taxes. So, my view is, is that one of the ways that this region is going to become wealthy is you're going to become pioneers in green taxation. And maybe you'll make it even more effective by doing a kind of interstate compact among the various governments in New England. So all of you are shifting your taxes to green taxes at the same time. Number nine, now we get into the world of money. One of the things that you're going to be doing in order to make yourself more wealthy is to expand credit to small businesses. One of the ways you're going to do that is continue to move your money from big banks to local banks and credit unions. And the Move Your Money campaign has been remarkably successful. About two million people have done so in recent years. One reason this is so important is that local banks and credit unions is where almost all the small lending is coming from. Local banks and credit unions account for, well, if we include medium-sized banks too, that's 20% of the assets of the U.S. banking sector, and yet they are responsible for 56% of small business lending. That's why this is so important. Another thing you might do is approach your local bank or credit union and say, you know, I still would like to see you do more lending. How's this? Why don't you create a special kind of certificate of deposit? And people will put money into it. They know the money is at risk. But we will target that money to support specific kinds of local businesses that we really care about. And a great precedent that occurred in Boston was Equal Exchange. They approached their bank, um, now Eastern Bank, and they said, let's create some uh, fair trade CDs. They have sold a million dollars worth of fair trade CDs, giving Equal Exchange a million dollar line of credit. 
at the back. We should be doing this in every community in the United States, creating specialty CDs around, say, local food businesses or local energy businesses or the co-op power CDs. Revolving loan funds. You know, we're, we, we need to supplement lending in banks. Banks are inherently very conservative animals, so we need to supplement this with a lot more dedicated community load, loan funds. There, there are probably a thousand community loan funds in the United States, but there are really only three in which unaccredited investors, that is the 99% of us who are not wealthy, can participate. So an example is ECDI, Economic and Community Development Institute in Columbus, Ohio. They have 14 revolving loan funds for local small business. The most recent one is open to unaccredited investors. There are also funds, the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund and the Mountain Biz Fund in North Carolina. Those are the other examples out there. I've been working uh, with Jeff Rosen around here in Solidago to take PV Grows and create a kind of sister fund that would be also open to unaccredited investors. Of course, co-ops can set up funds like this as well. La Montanita Co-op, a co-op uh, with five supermarkets in New Mexico, has set up its own revolving loan fund primarily to support uh, the local food suppliers and small farmers that are very much a part of its uh, supply chain in the state. P2P is peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, I know you were talking a little bit about this earlier today. Uh, so Kickstarter, of course, and Indiegogo, these are donation sites, basically, they are not securities. Kiva is Muhammad Yunus in electronic form. You can kick in $100 as a loan to, say, a worthy micro-entrepreneur, mostly in the global south. Increasingly, it's happening a little bit in the United States. Because you're only loaning out principal and you're not taking interest, in most states, this is not regarded as a security. So that's how this thing is, is legally kosher. Prosper is a different animal. Prosper.com does pay you interest, um, and Prosper had to spend $4 million uh, with the SEC to get itself kosher under the law. My problem with all of these things is that every $100 you put into a great project in San Francisco under Kickstarter, or a great micro-entrepreneur in Bolivia, is $100 that's unavailable for a great project or a great micro-entrepreneur in New England. So what we increasingly need to do is to work with these websites to localize them. Some are doing this already. So an example is the funding circle in the United Kingdom, which creates community circles that link lenders and borrowers within particular cities in the United Kingdom, like Manchester. Another way that we can expand credit is creative use of pre-selling, because pre-selling in most states also is not regarded as a security. So Awaken Cafe in Oakland needed to move to another venue. They needed $100,000 to build out this new location. They decided that rather than waste that $100,000 on filings for, uh, for lawyers with the securities department, they would instead pre-sell coffee. So you could buy $1,200 worth of coffee for $1,000 today. And as soon as the new store opens up, you get the $1,200 worth of coffee. They mostly financed their expansion this way. Number 10, we're going to get really creative with public policy in providing credit. So one of the ways we're going to do it is we're going to expand public banks. So many of you are familiar with the fact that North Carolina, and North Dakota, is the only state in the United States with a public bank. But most people don't really understand what it does. 
when you hear public bank, you think, oh, they've got you know, North Dakota bank storefronts throughout the state and they're competing with other local banks and credit unions and everyone's upset. Just the opposite. What they do is the money that comes into North Dakota from taxpayers, which normally goes to J.P. Morgan Chase, right, and, and does economic development work in Malaysia, that money is instead put on deposit in local banks and credit unions throughout the state. The same thing with federal money that is transferred uh, for welfare programs and, and uh, joint state federal programs in North Dakota. As a result, North Dakota has the highest per capita level of small business lending in the country. I want to read you something that gives you a, a sense of the value of this. I may go five minutes over. I'm, I, I apologize. Um, so I, this, is, this, uh, this is reading from um, a riveting journal that I know many of you subscribe to called U.S. Banker. <laughs> it says, consider this tale of two cities, Grand Forks, North Dakota, suffered massive flooding that left it economically crippled in April 2007. So did East Grand Forks, just across the river in Minnesota. Three years later, Grand Forks had lost 3% of its population, and East Grand Forks had lost 17%. Those who were pushing for states like Illinois and Washington to create a publicly owned bank insist this difference in economic recovery is no coincidence. They give much of the credit for Grand Forks resiliency, only one minute by car from its Minnesota counterpart, to the 92-year-old Bank of North Dakota the country's only state-owned bank. Its help came in many forms, including a quickly established $25 million line of credit for the city itself. Every state in this country needs a bank like the Bank of North Dakota. We also need to start using municipal bonds to support real economic development. Um, there's lots of experience in using municipal bonds for dumb economic development, the latest corporate attraction, the latest industrial development part. We need to start using it to support loans to local small business. So I've done a couple of food studies in places like Denver and Boulder County and Cleveland, and one of the main recommendations is the creation of food bonds the proceeds of which would be used to collateralize loans to great local food businesses from existing banks and credit unions. I want to point out something here. By a show of hands, how many people do their banking at a local bank or credit union? Yeah, we're in the right place. <laughs> now, by show of hands, those of you with pension funds, how many of you have them invested in local small business? Okay, so there's a couple of you, and this is a much higher percentage of hands than I normally see, so we know we're among, among real pioneers. And yet, this is outrageous. You are the best local boards of New England. And look at how many hands were down. I've just shown you data that local business is half your economy by jobs and output. It is more profitable than regular business. It is becoming more competitive. Surely you are putting all of your money into local business, and you, you are not. None of it is going in there. Right now you have $30 trillion in stocks, bonds, insurance funds, pension funds, and uh, mutual funds. And this money is being 100% invested in Wall Street. I have a simple objection, uh, objective, which is a $15 trillion shift, moving half of our money from Wall Street to Main Street. $15 trillion works out to $50,000 per capita. Even in a 1,000-person community, that's $50 million more of investment capital. In a 10,000-person community, five billion dollars more of investment capital. I'm sorry, half a billion more. Um, these are significant data. And we know there's lots of things that we could invest that money into. We could invest that money into co-op expansions. 
we could invest that money into relationships that we build with networks like LIAM. LIAM stands for the Local Investment Opportunities Network in poor towns in Washington, started by this guy, James Fraser. Um, someone pointed out in the earlier discussion that um, there is a, um, that the law says you can only approach people you have a pre-existing relationship. Even if they're accredited investors, you can only approach them if you have a pre-existing relationship. Well, what Fraser has done is he has a party every month. <laughs> Brings investors, businesses to the party. At the end of the party, they check off who they now have a pre-existing relationship with. <laughs> and based on that, he circulates business plans. Just this one social innovation has led to $3 million more going into local business since 2008 in a 10,000 person town. Hopefully we will see a New England based crowdfunding site that makes it clear who are the local businesses that are deserving of local investment. The slide here I have is of the Merck or Mercantile in Powell, Wyoming, an early example of a local stock issue. I would like to see us create a New England stock exchange. Michael Van Patten of Mission Markets is one guy who's ready to work with you to help create this. And I am now working with him to help you create this. So anyone who wants to create a stock exchange here, because we're going to see in next year a proliferation of local stock issues, but they're not going to have liquidity. So we want to create a trading platform so that people have the ability to buy and sell these shares. And we need to create local mutual funds. Here's the outrageous fact. We have 7,500 mutual funds in the United States and not a single one invests in local small business. Not because it's illegal, but because we lack innovation in our institutions. And the way that things are going to play out is that, you know, next year we're going to see a proliferation of local stock and direct public offerings. Then we're going to see the emergence of local stock markets. Once we have a critical mass of tradable stock, we'll start to create some local investment portfolios, mutual funds, and finally, we'll start moving our pension funds. Perhaps public pension funds will be the home run that starts to really propel the local economy forward here. But in the absence of that, We'll have investment clubs like No Small Potatoes in Maine. Or you'll use the secret weapon of local investment, so secret that a dummies book has been written about it. <laughs> the self-directed IRA. Everything we just talked about can be invested in with a self-directed IRA. Keep your money in your existing IRA and 401k, and you can only do it in the 7,500 mutual funds that don't touch local business. But with a self-directed IRA, you could put money into co-op power. You could put money into your local stock market. You could put it into a local revolving loan fund. You could put it into municipal bonds. The only thing you really can't put the money into is your house or your kid's house. But interestingly, you could put the money in your neighbor's house. And your neighbor can put his or her money into your house. And therein lies my talk for next year. <laughs> where I want to end, and where I end Local Dollars, Local Cents, is with a children's story, which to me is a reminder of the key to prosperity. And the key to prosperity is to avoid the temptation to travel 10,000 miles from home to find wealth that you should have found in your own backyard. In a book of Blue So Blue by Jean-Francois Dumont, a, a, a child who is obsessed with the color blue, um, just paints it everywhere. Everywhere he goes, he paints the color blue. And here, you know, here he is at work there. But there is one shade of blue that has haunted him in his dreams, and he can't figure out where the shade of blue comes from. So he goes on a journey. 
he decides to go to the Louvre, checks out the paintings there. No, the blue is not in any of those paintings. He goes on an ocean journey, and he can't find the blue in the ocean anywhere. Well, then he goes to a blues bar in New Orleans. <laughs> not, not there. He goes to a desert, and there a blue-hooded stranger says, what you've been looking for may never have been very far away. And suddenly, it dawns on him that that shade of blue was in his mother's eyes. Thank you very much. <laughs>
on deposit with a you know fair set of rules, that you know, transparent set of rules about how money gets allocated to all locally owned institutions in the state. Um, it, I, I think that the checks and balances you can put on that will make it a fairer system, uh, a more scrutable system than, than the money going to Malaysia. I, I just seems to me that what you're doing now is the worst of all worlds. Chase Bank for, for um, you know, the, the, the Wall Street organizations that are putting money in Malaysia is one thing, but what I'm suggesting is that as we talk about yeah. a state bank, as we talk about increasing the power of our local economic development apparatus, we have to be putting in some kind of a control system checks so, that the check, so that the development that we're supporting yeah. is supporting our vision and is not either enriching somebody who's well connected or carrying out, you know, financing more big box stores right. that are owned by different people. Yeah. Because th there's a lot of bad development that is being supported by our public officials right now. Wrong. Especially in Western Mass. I mean, this, the Governor, Pat Governor Patrick and, and Lieutenant Governor Murray are down there taking the credits for supporting the freaking Chicopee Crossing project to build another stupid sprawl project. They literally are doing, have just done it. In, so, you know, right. the buildings are in Chicopee. challenge of like getting you know one or two slightly higher than average counties in Western Mass to, to put in effect this. So it's you know it's a it's a bigger challenge in a state the size of Massachusetts. And I, I, I totally agree with you that um, putting some attention on these rules is important. I don't know exactly how they do it in North Dakota. I haven't read of any complaints about corruption that have happened with it. But yeah, wherever money passes through people's hands, corruption can follow. 